Welcome back to the second hour of Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. Um, our thanks to Sue Pratt, who was with us for the first hour. And she, isn't she just amazing? Um, she's, you know, she shows us the, the life charts. Most people today do a PowerPoint presentation. Sue's comes on and she gives us these wonderful posters, handmade. She does everything by hand. She's a very analog person in the digital world. Marvelous presentation by Sue Pratt. She'll be back for another presentation on some other subjects as well in a future show. We'll announce that when it comes up. And this hour, we're going to talk about something that's both sobering and yet, um, well, encouraging as well, because what we try to do is to offer optimism and solutions. And my guest tonight brings both of those to the table. Before, uh, before I do that, you introduce the subject. Um, most of us today are aware of autism, which was unheard of uh, back in the 1960s, certainly here in the United States. Autism was very rarely ever spoken of. Today, as you can see on the screen, the numbers of exponential rises of autism spectrum disorder are, are rapidly accelerating. And with that, we now have a population of people who have to deal with children who in, are in various stages of disability due to autism syndromes. And uh, as a result of that, we are looking for solutions. I know personally of many groups of parents out there with autistic children who are searching for solutions of how to deal with children all along the spectrum. And autism is not one single syndrome. It is many syndromes with many uh, variations and severity. My guest tonight comes to us from Alabama. Uh, Mrs. Mamta Mishra is with us. And uh, she's going to talk about her book tonight, Art uh, Autism, Our Journey, and Finding Happiness. The book is published by um, Fifth Estate Publishing, and it is available on Amazon.com. We'll put l links up with the show when it goes up in the archives. And with that, we want to welcome Mrs. Mamta Mishra. Welcome to Off Planet TV. Thank you, Randy, for inviting me to this show. You know, I'm so grateful because this journey uh, is going to be shared by people who need it. The whole purpose of this book for me writing it, you know, is to help. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yes, and it's, um, you know, as I said earlier, it's a sobering subject. You have two sons. We met your older son all, right before we came up tonight. Yes, yes. He was doing tech support on that side. So you have two children, one obviously fully abled. Your other son, your younger son, was born with what I refer to as profound autism syndrome. Yes. Give us a little bit of background on the history of that and what you experienced. Uh, Randy, he was diagnosed, he was born in 1994, mm -hmm. and uh, he was diagnosed with autism at age two years, seven months. Okay. So at that point of time, I didn't know what autism was, you know? So it was a new, totally new word for me, you know? I didn't know. So, and at that time I was uh, studying for computers. So when I came to know about this, then I started reading books on autism and it was pretty dreary, whatever I read. So, and my husband is a physician. So he, uh, I went to him and I said, there has to be something. And he said, I'm sorry, there is no cure. You know, so from there I started. And uh, it was like first thing first was to, you know, gain knowledge. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was very important to, you cannot be an advocate or you cannot teach until unless you are armed with the ammunition of knowledge. So that became very important to know and to dig in deeper and find how I can help Parag, my son who has autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, it is, the first thing is that, you know, you go through why phase. So yes. why, every, all of us go through that why phase. Yes. And I was going through that too. And then, of course, my, the grandparents, all of the low, the degree that is like the, the degree that all of us have, the lowest one is masters in this house. 
you know, so the grandparents, like, you know, they are highly educated, everybody. So it was like for the grandparents, oh, no, what has happened, you know, that my kid, like, my grandson won't be able to go to a college, you know, so things like that. So then I had to come, you know, I had to start all the negativity that was there. I had to like, you know, block it away. And, you know, I got out from the why phase faster, you know, because, and that has been a great thing for me because, um, you know, I, at some point I had to think, okay, Prague has autism. And, you know, so how do I deal with it? Am I going to cry, you know, and mope and you and sulk? Or am I going to just embrace it and then see what can be done about it, you know? So that is how the journey started. And I decided, no, I'm going to, you know, fight this fight head on. And I'm here now, you know, with this book. So you did you spent that time with the why the why stage which is that shock that's the human emotional response to something that we realize is sad, sad challenging and beyond our control but you went to the proactive you began to educate yourself about first what autism is and how it is expressed what were your initial signs of your son's disability? Was he non-responsive in certain ways? Um, how did the doctors diagnose him? How did you realize his condition? Okay, um, Ankur, my older son and Prague, they're 10 months apart, you know? So I was like, I, you know, the developmentally, I had this thing, mm -hmm. okay, Ankur was doing this when he was six months. Yes, yes. And Prague is not doing it, you know? So he was not repeating words after us. You know, when you, and that was, but generally that doesn't happen. A lot of times what happens with the kid with, kids with autism is that um, it, approximately around 15 months, they, they have words and they're doing developmentally yes. all right, but then they start losing it, you know? So that's what generally happens. But, you know, all these kids, you know, they have some symptomatic behaviors which are, you know, similar. So they may not have eye contact, which Prague didn't have eye contact. He had, uh, we call it echolalia, which is like meaningless repetition of word. You know, they don't uh, attack, they don't know actually what that word means, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, even so-called normal kids, you know, they come, they do that, you know, at some phase, but then they, you know, they are able to, you know, attach meaning to the words. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, so, they learn by rote. Yes. So initially they mimic, exactly. and eventually they learn to attach meaning yes. to the expression. Uh, so there were, you know, these symptoms. Yeah. He was walking, um, a lot of these kids, they walk on their toes, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the hand flapping, things like that, you know, hyperextending the body. So these are some of the symptom uh, symptomatic behaviors. And not having eye contact is one of the major ones. You know, because when you have eye contact, I'm looking at you. Yeah. I see your facial expressions. I learn, you know, from that. So the cues. So those were, you know, missing. And um, so that made me go to the pediatrician, you know, and then he was the one who uh, said, well, you know, looking, he just, he let Prague go and said, let me observe, you know, you just sit down and um, always be thankful for him because that is what led to the early diagnosis. Like, you know, Prague was now two years, 11 months. We figured it out that he has autism. And then gradually the program that I'm running even now came along, you know, so you know, the homeschooling. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, how was he effectively? Did he respond to you? Did Was there interaction in terms of the normal um, cuddling and uh, emotional responses, what what doctors usually call affect, the appropriate responses to another person. It, no, Randy, it wasn't there. You yeah. know, that hugging and, you yes. know, kissing, things he mm -hmm. didn't like that touch. He would be in the corner, which generally 
a lot of kids do, like, you know, with autism, is that they'll be in the corner. They're very happy with the, uh, themselves, you know. They'll be like, you know, uh, some object they're fixated with it. They can play with that, those for hours and hours, you know. And that is what Prague was also doing. And that was uh, one of the signs which was like, and everybody would be like, Oh, he's such a, a you know a low maintenance baby. He's happy. He plays with himself. He doesn't give you any trouble. And uh, well, it was no no low maintenance at all. It, it is very high maintenance, you know, when it comes to autism. Yes. So he is around the age of about almost three years old when you discover this. Yes. And you go through your grieving. You go through your time of of searching. But in your proactive stage, obviously, you research this. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of, it's a very controversial subject, as I'm sure you know. Oh, yeah. Um, connected, obviously, to things like vaccines and things like that. Um, but in terms of the research that you did about the syndrome itself, you then went to another level. And I want to walk you through the progression of this of what you began to do to address the problem creatively, because really the point of the book is sharing your journey and then sharing how you began to put together something that is not only a program for you and your son, but it is a program for families who both have autistic children and learning disabled children because it extends into learning disabled children. And it is very centered around, as you pointed out earlier, home education, homeschooling, and basically not an institutional approach to it, which is, you know, I, I, I have a number of, I've, I have a friend of mine who has a, an older son. He's, um, I believe, 20, 21 years old now who grew up in an era when we didn't have as much understanding about autism. And this family has fought for years to keep their son because the authorities have wanted to take him because obviously as an autistic child goes through puberty, they go through periods of aggression and things like that. Very, very difficult situation. And um, I know the, the struggles that they've gone to financial hardship, the hardship of parents who have to put up with, you know, the long hours it takes. And now with the work that you're doing, and I'm sure there's other people out there who are joining with you, we begin to get a window on some solutions that hopefully enable families to have a way to do this with a little bit more ease and a little bit more grace. So kind of step us through what you did in your proactive stage, what you learned, and how you moved into designing the program that you, you've used with your son. Okay, what I did, Randy, was that I realized that the recommendations that were made in IEP, you know, Individual Education Plan mm -hmm. uh, for yes. Prague, it was very hard for the school system to meet that. Yes. And uh, even if they did, what I was, even if they could, what was happening was Prague was learning, you know, people say that kids with autism are not able to imitate initially. But that's not, you know, with Prague's case, that was not so, but, you know, but the, we, what he was doing in the school, I did send him to a public school, you know, oh, really? and there were, yeah, in the beginning. And then there were like 11 kids and they all had, you know, different kind of uh, special needs situations, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a kid in that classroom who was like, who when he got uh, upset, he would hit his head um, yes. on the floor and Prague yes. learned that. You know, so it was like, oh, no. You know, and then what happened was it, that uh, Prague was also mumbling, you know, which we still tackle, like, you know, he knows and then he's able to, you know, control that now. So he was mumbling and then he would, um, you know, he'd pinch other people, you know, mm -hmm. at that point mm -hmm. of time. And I was like, no, this is not going to work in a school system and we need to... Uh, have one-on-one, -on -one, which was recommended, we need one-on-one -on -one more. And the school system was not able to provide that amount of, you know, that that one-on-one -on -one that he needed. So I realized that I cannot, you know, I, I, I shouldn't 
me and my husband like talked about it and like I cannot dissipate my energy into the red tape you know I have to do something because time is the essence and I want to tell you know uh, every parent that early intervention is must you know so the early, the earlier the better and another thing that is very important is that you know with the early intervention and there's a lot of research about it you know another thing that is important is that consistent and persistent early intervention you cannot do like you know i did this one day and then i'm taking a break for two days and then i'll come back to it no it doesn't work you know so we started doing all this with prag was that early so what actually we did with in early intervention was trying to reduce trying to eliminate the symptomatic behaviors you know that generally these kids with autism show and which we already talked about are like you know no eye contact so in the book you will if you have, you know when you read you see that you know what i did how i did to you know take it away so that that behavior is eliminated he looks you know how he started coming in let's, uh, stop, there for, let's stop there for a minute because that's a big one uh, what did you do with prawn in order to address that specific issue? The eye contact? Yeah, that, that consistent action that you did with the eye contact. Okay, this is, you know, what I did was like, he wouldn't look, you know, uh, in the eyes. So what I would do is this, you know, I like, um, I'll put like, make a V sign at mm -hmm. my eyes and say, Prague, look at my eyes. And at my, like, you know, here at the nose point, I'll put, put a, M&M, uh, the, the candies, you know, because he loved candies, that's a reinforcer. And that at that time, he loved these tangible, you know, reinforcers or rewards. So I'll do this. And then he looked in my eyes and then I'll pop that candy in his mouth. And he was ready. Then another thing I did was that, you know, the it's called that spin wheel, you know, the, the toy, you know, and then I'll do this and then I'll just bring it because, you know, these kids, they love the revolving uh, stuff, you know, all that. So like, you know, in the beginning phases, I used whatever he was perseverating on as a tool, as a, uh, a reward tool, you know, to, to make him do what I wanted him to do. So then gradually the eye contact increased, you know, and this is, I'm still doing it, you know, so this is like what I was doing at that time. Yes. And yeah. then once he could look in my eyes, what happened, he was looking at me, my lips, you know, he was, we all need to do that. Then he started, you know, gradually, because he was doing, looking at me, the facial expression, the, you know, he started uh, imitating words also, you know, so that came gradually, but the eye contact was very important. By, by doing that, you were modeling behavior, you were drawing him Attention, yeah. to focus into that place. Yes, yes. So that was one of the, you know, uh, big symptomatic behavior. Mm -hmm. Then another thing that I want to talk about is um, these, you know, the kids with autism, you'll see they, you know, they a lot of times they hyperextend their body or they, you know, they flap their hands, you know, yes. Yes. and Prague, he, he does, he used to do that too. He doesn't do that anymore, but the intervention is important because I want to draw attention to this and how we, um, you know, kind of eliminated this behavior. It is what we did was, you know, asked him to put his hands in the pocket. So that's an intervention, but you, they, that's a sensory behavior. So they, they have that need to do it. So now the coping skill is like, you know, like in the book I have said that coping, you know, you, you have to give coping skill to the kids and then do the intervention plan. So coping skill is like, you know, uh, taking somebody who's drowning to take them out from, you know, the water. And then intervention is like, you know, to make, you know, teach them to swim. Mm -hmm. So with Prague, that is what it was. Like he, he had this need to, you know, flick his hand. So then we said, okay, you know, put your hands in the pocket. So what happened was in when he's in the public, it doesn't draw negative attention. Mm -hmm. So he is still doing it, but he's doing it in the pocket, you know, and then that, you know, and then gradually 
because he was it's very hard if you put your hand in the pocket and try to flick it flick your hands it's very hard to do so what happened was gradually the brain was sending the signal but it was not getting the response you know so over time uh the the both the intensity and the frequency of that behavior started going down and then he also became aware because we'll be saying bra good job for keeping your hands in the yes. pocket you know and then he became aware and he started doing it on his own positive reinforcement yes yes yes, yes. now you actually went so far as to switch your majors you were you were studying at university and you switched your majors and went into another concentration of study in order to enable you to design the curriculum that you designed and to deal with prons issue and to gain uh, i guess what we would call an advanced degree of understanding about that tell us a little bit about your studies and what you concentrated in and how you applied those uh I went to Jacksonville State University but before I tell you I will tell you what made me do that you know? okay so I, so I was taking parag to um Emory University which has a family program called Walden School so every wednesday I'll take parag which is like two and a half hours of drive from my home to Emory University so over there when um Prag reached that like he was so tired that he wouldn't perform anything that the therapist had told me to teach him you know over the whole week mm -hmm. so um and then I'll tell the therapist now he can do it he can do it and she'll be like uh yeah keep patience you know one day he will and then I'm like no well she's thinking I'm like to like you know whatever i'm a very enthusiastic mother or i'm not accepting the fact that he's not doing you know what the skills and task we are teaching him so i came back home and i videotaped everything and then i went like you know i went back the next time and this and i showed it to her and she believed me so that is what happened was like what she believed me like you know i'm like okay seeing is believing people if they see so that's when the video taping of all the skills and tasks started coming and then what happened was uh that also made me decide that i have to go to the university and uh, jacksonville provided the special education so i enrolled myself in masters because i was like i need to be educated and gain knowledge in this field to help prague and not just prague help you know other kids other special need kids and also like you know kids with autism and that is what made me go to um, pursue this degree and then all these video tapes i have a lot of like you know video tapes of prague so when i was uh studying i could use it as a visual you know so the professors would be like mamta you need to write a book i'm like i was convinced at that time you know I, i didn't you know and it has taken me 18 years to be convinced so when prague started you know uh, making these candles and you know soaps and other products that and i realized that it has come to stay then i i felt that this story is worth sharing now it would be very selfish of me if i didn't you know so i stepped out and did that you know as the candle maker's mother yes yes your i son, am your son is an entrepreneur basically he is he's learned to do things that are um useful aesthetic and a source of creativity to him which i can't help but think for an autistic person to be able to express themselves in the physical world which is where they're struggling this has got to be a marvelous gift how did you discover his affinity to work with with candles with wax and to create things like that um uh, okay let me go back a little bit before you know because you said something very um very important was that these you know kids with autism i want you to know this they they understand we don't talk to them we don't what as a teacher you know or as a parent what we do is we 
we talk to them in command language, you know, and it's so it's like, do this, do this, or it's, it's totally instructional. So what they do is they perform, but then it is a mechanical thing. That's what yes. we are training them for. It's objectification, but, basically. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, so what in this book, you will realize that, you know, and I have asked, you know, all the caregivers, teachers and parents, you know, talk to them because they understand, you know, so talking is different, you know, than just like, you know, um, giving instructions and commands, you know, it's involving, it's a two way process. So we have to listen to them, you know, that's very important. And even the behaviors are like their way to tell us, hey, I'm saying something, you're not listening. So anyhow, from, you know, I'm going to share how this uh, vocation came about. By that time, Prague was able to, there are some skills he already had, you know, is like he can sit in the classroom. He was able to like, you know, he, he likes to, paint and draw and he's very precise that is the ocd thing that works for him you know? mm -hmm. so, that's interesting that's very yes yes some ocd behaviors work yes. you know? so and this one does so what happened was like when he turned 18 actually he was going to turn 18 and uh, so in 2012 i think three years back i went to this residential facility where they have you know um, special needs individuals uh, who stay over there. And I was like Prague's uh, pediatric neurologist who told me you need to go because you'll be, you know, right now you're young, but gradually you'll grow old. And then you need a, a place where you feel comfortable yeah. for him to be there. So I can't, even now it's very hard for me to think a lot, you know, Prague not being around me, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but I did, I did take that advice and me, my husband and Prague's teacher, we all three went to uh, see this place. And I was really, I mean, it's local, you know, it's right here about mm -hmm. like, you know, 50 minutes of drive from my home. And I was very impressed by that place because the person who has started it is a farmer actually and he has a son who uh, ha who has mr you know mm -hmm. and yeah and uh, explain what mr is please uh, it's a, a mental retardation that's okay. what it is okay. called. yeah but, what we would uh, call down syndrome yeah yeah okay so uh, so he didn't find, this father didn't find anything where, where he was, any place where he was comfortable to put his son. So he created, you know, it must have been such a big journey for him to create a place, not just for his son, but for so many people. And what I was impressed at that facility was that they have a workshop and this, we have a Honda plant here which gives these kids some work to do. So I saw like there was one supervisor and five or six people like sitting around the table, like, you know, these special needs individuals, the, and they were like putting um, like uh, parts, car parts from each tray into a Ziploc, okay? So I, when I saw that, I was like amazed. I thought this is great because they are occupied, they are, you know, uh, they're doing something positive, you know, with that time. So when I came back home, I was like, I need to find something for Parag. So I sent him, like, you know, I sent Parag for evaluation uh, at a local place over here. And uh, it was not good. The evaluation didn't come out good because they said uh, something like that. At this point of time, uh, Prague is not capable of Jo you know, joining the workforce or doing anything, something like that. I remember, you know, that I just, I had that paper in my hand in my kitchen and I just sank down on my knees. I prayed, I prayed to God. I was crying and praying and I said, please God, show me a path. And I believe that this, you know, this voice talked to me and said, mom, it's October, Christmas is around the corner. Why don't you go teach Prague to make candles? I have guilt. I mean, no knowledge of making candles. I went to a, a local place which uh, sells all this stuff. I took, uh, you know, I got the book on candle making. And initially I started on like, you know, the, I have to first learn before I can teach, you know, because you mm -hmm. cannot teach experiments to Prague. You know, you have to teach the results of the experiments. So then 
uh, that was like the wax candle is very dangerous. You cannot, you know, and there are so many things I can go on talking about because this has been my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, this is the gel candle was very, um, very forgiving, you know, because you can, if you make mistakes, you can always, you know, redo it. And you know, so that's how the teaching started. And then what happened was uh, we gave away all these candles to all my friends and they were like, oh, wow, it's so pretty and all that. And then uh, one of my friends who had a gift shop here locally, I just happened to talk to her. I said, uh, Lisa, what, you know, what now, you know, all this is going to wrap up and it will start again in Christmas, next Christmas. And she said, can I see what he has done? So I showed her the candles and she said, can I sell them? And I'm like, really? And that's how it all started. So that's it. And that Christmas, like all his candles got sold. And that is how it just continued, you know, so. It's interesting because you look at that situation, you know, it seems so hopeless. And yet you were able to kind of hone in on something and identify. And yes, I believe in the power of prayer and the inspiration of God to be able to show us a path. Yes. And I, I, that's actually, I, I was just sitting here kind of really feeling what you were going through as you were talking about that. Um, but, the, you know, going back to autism for a minute, Autistic kids, if we watch them, we realize, and I noticed this right away because I tend to be somewhat OCD myself. I mean, oh, my yeah. wife would say more than a little <laughs> I mean, as a personality type. But when I've watched autistic children, and over the years I've had a chance to do that, I knew a man who worked in a ministry with autistic children, and I would observe them and I would note what they were interested in and how they would fixate on it. When we look at things like that, we realize there's a gift there. It doesn't look like it, but not many people can focus on things anymore. Most people live in a world of cell phones and fast cars and a very fast lifestyle. These are people whose, their consciousness, their mental process is different. It's, it's slower, it's more attenuated than um, our processes. And somewhere in that, there is a gift. And, you know, what I just heard you say is you found a gift inside of something that looked like a hopeless situation. Yeah, that is that is true, Randy, because I, I really feel that all these kids, all these kids are able to, you know, they are born with a, with a gift. It's theirs, you know, as a caregiver, you know, as a parent, as a teacher, we have to believe in that. And then you have, we have to bring it out, you know, and it, it can turn into a beautiful thing, you know, because people are very accepting. That's what I see, you know, with Prague's, uh, what he's doing. So he has like 50 some women who have adopted him and his work, you know, so, yeah, so it's, it's awesome. And then they write, he has a comment book and they write in the in the comment book and then we read it to him and boy he is in love with himself i'll tell you about prague you know he loves himself so it is like when you read that he's like yeah prague do you love making candle yes you know so that's that's something and when you see the videos at the end of this book you know if you go to youtube channel there is, and just type in the name of the book you can see you know kind of linear progression of Prague, you know, into like what, how he was, you know, when he was young. Uh, then he went for a while, he went to a private school and there were these two girls who were like mother hen around him, which led to th that social skill that these kids lack, you know. So that was like, you know, something that he got to learn uh, there. And then like, you know, it is, I just believe that, you know, all these kids are able to chip in into our workforce if we are able, if we can see their abilities as a parents, teacher, caregivers. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I, I see it in, in, in the book, is communication skills. Yeah. Um, this is obviously one of the biggest obstacles that, well, most children with learning disabilities have on some level because that's where it's the most obviously manifested but also with autistic children communication seems almost impossible because of the shell that they have around them 
what is what is your assessment of prong as he went through um his education um his communication skills when you began where he's at today and how you got him there because this is a really critical bridge that people need to cross as i have uh reiterated in the book, you know, when I say early intervention, what I mean is that you have to, like, there are three deficit areas, you know, uh, that these kids have, and that is, like, social skills, communication skills, and then they have behavior problems. Mm -hmm. So, all these, if we can work on these areas, first of all, the symptomatic behaviors that they have, if you reduce it through intervention plans, then they become automatically, they, you know, they become socially acceptable. The mo moment you're socially acceptable, then you'll be around people. So then you'll be learning things, you know, so it becomes a process of uh, back and forth where, you know, you give, you learn. And so the communication increases. The first thing though is, to reduce the behavior, you know, so that is very important. The tantrums, the things, and how can you do that? That's very, you know, if I'm not motivated to do something, then you know, you cannot make me do it. So, the most important thing is to motivate these kids into doing what you want them to learn. You know, so and the motivation can happen if you know if you can bring that interest. You have to have you know, they reinforces the positive, you know, rewards that they want, you know, and how to use it. And the chapter that says, you know, um, about the reinforces is like, you know, I go through it, you know, how we have done that, how we, how we came from tangible rewards to where he now, Prague just enjoys praises. You can make him, you know, if you praise him, you can make him do things. So, mm -hmm. so that's where we have uh, come come to. Also, uh, I have talked about conditioning of behaviors, you know, so it's very, you know, you have to be very careful when you condition a behavior, because once these kids learn to do something, then it's very hard to undo it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what happens is, for example, it's funny, and I'll share it to you. It's like, I just, Prague and I have a game, you know, where I just, uh, you know, I would give my elbow and we, we call it uh, elbow kissy wissy, you know. So I give my elbow to him to kiss and he gives me his elbow to kiss, you know. And it was our game, elbow kissy wissy, you know, mom and son, we are doing it. And now he gives his elbow to people like here, you know. So, so I'm like, oh, no, what did I do? So, you know, before we we start something when we really have to go through because once now that's it he has learned like you know he thinks that's what we should do like you know give you know people will kiss give you kiss here so uh, this is something very uh, benign that i'm talking about but you know it could be something very serious so we really need to before we plan the intervention plans you know the behavior modifications we have to sit down and see kind of visualize the repercussions of it you know so it is like i do believe that communication is can happen and i have taught like you know prague this is the behavior is prague doesn't have and he has coping skills you know i shouldn't say that and i should say that he has coping skills for his behaviors you know and then as you read the book you will know like you know a lot of things like like uh Suppose, okay, I'll tell you. Uh, when he gets hit, it's called SIB, which is self uh, injurious behavior. You know, so he, when he gets frustrated, he bites on his wrist. So, what we do now as an intervention, what we have done is he has a wristband, you know, so he doesn't hurt himself. And it is, and then, because that's like maybe he's frustrated with the work or, you know, and then he'll, he'll do that. So the, what we have done is like we give him a hanky, so which is always in the pocket. And the moment he has that need, he, he transfers that behavior on the hanky. And then we say, Prah, good job, good job not, you know, biting on your wrist. You know? And then another thing that we have taught him is, Prah, if, if something gets very hard for you, you do, if you want to, uh, a break, say break. You know? So he will tell you, he will say, all done finished, you know, break. 
so that before he gets too frustrated, he he is able to communicate that uh, that need. That's a need, you know. So uh, so he is able to do that. But that is you have to start teaching. And as I said, and I'm going to emphasize again, is that it's important to talk, you know. So when talking happens, then you know a lot of things will start happening. And also, we should give them the opportunity to make mistakes. As we, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll yes. tell you this: no, our education system is not geared towards them making no. mistakes. When we make the IEP, it is like in individual education plan for them. It's like eighty percent correct criteria, eighty-five percent correct criteria. That's how we go. So recently, what Prague was making something, you know. So I have. I have come up with, you know, the products that he make, it's always cups, 10 cups and spoons and things like that. So he was trying to fill like, you know, uh, a bag which needed just five spoon of something. But he was like, no, 10, you know, so he's going on filling 10, you know. And I, so I let him do it, you know. I, and then once it started overflowing, he's like, here, mom, take it, you know. So he gave it to me. And that is it from letting him do that he was visually able to see that this is not going right you know and then i was able to teach him in prague we just need five we just need five spoonfuls to fill this back so so we need need to give them the opportunity you know to yeah. learn from their mistakes also yeah that's kind of experiential learning rather than saying do this follow my instructions which you know you just pointed out a fundamental flaw of the American public edu education system, and it's one that I've held for years, is that um, there's no margin there for failure, basically. You know, perfection is the ultimate high mark, and everything between that is scaled. But as human beings, we know we learn from mistakes, and we also sometimes swerve into things that are very interesting as a result of mistakes. So, you know, you... Your training, um, your education, did that kind of help you to come to a process in, in putting Prague's um, programs together? Did you, did you find that you got a structure, a framework from, what were your studies? What, what were your studies after you changed from computers um, at, at university? But, you know, once I went uh, to seek this, you know, knowledge, uh, it was like uh, my degree is in master's in special education. Okay. And, and I, I, while I was, you know, studying there at the university, it was, it's called applied behavioral analysis. So whatever I'm, I have taught Parag is, and what it is actually is like how we take information, how we process it. Mm -hmm. And then how we retain it and use it, you know, so that's what applied behavioral analysis is in simple terms, you know, but that has shown to work with uh, kids with autism and, you know, Asperger's, um, mm -hmm. you know, other special needs kid. So this approach helped me. So in the, in the broader uh, spectrum, I have used applied behavioral analysis, but I've used a lot of common sense, you know, in the whole approach. And common sense, I have found, is the most uncommon thing, you know. Yes, it <laughs> is, actually. Yes, very much so. So uh, what happened, you know, in this field, what I see is that a teacher, you know, a degree in teaching, you know, for me, it, it gave me knowledge, you know. But if, if I don't have a loving heart, then there's no point of that, you know, of all that knowledge. First thing first, you know, whoever is dealing with kids in general, you know, mm -hmm. and then with special need kids, they should have a very loving and empathetic heart, you know. So I, as it says in the book that, you know, a service industry like this needs Mother Teresa's heart in every teacher, you know. So, you know, so that is... That is very important that, you know, and then in uh, when you were asking me about the teaching methods, you know, in that, in applied behavioral analysis, I have used now when I'm going to use some terms and I'll explain it too. Uh, I have used like incidental teaching. Now, what is incidental teaching? It just happens incidentally. 
but not accidentally. Yeah. Not accidentally. Now let me explain. You know, uh, it is a very good way to increase communication among kids with autism. What basically I do, uh, and I did at that time, was suppose he Prague liked something and he didn't want to talk. You know, that was you know he didn't want to talk, and uh, it would be uh, converted into tantrums if he wanted something. You know, so what I did was like if he liked something which he re- I knew that he was perseverating, I'll put it on top of an armor, you know, or, you know, he cannot reach it. It will be locked, you know, but he can see it, you know, so it could be like a curio, you know, so it's like, it's locked, it's, it has glass door, he's able to see his favorite toy in there, so he's like, you know, then he's like, he's pointing, you know, one, you know so basically pointing is communication. And then I'm like, what do you want? Do you want your truck? So Prague say, say truck, and then he'll be like truck. And that's when he got it, you know? And then we in go, went on increasing it, you know? So like increasing, like basically uh, expanding the sentence. Want truck, I want truck. So that's how it went. So this is incidental teaching. But then I love something I'll tell you that is teachable moments. Teachable moments are very organic teaching, you know. It's like the interaction between a mother and a child, you know. So it just happens. They're curious. They'll ask you something. And then, you know, you gave the answer. If it is very interesting to both the parties, it continues. So that's a teachable moment, you know. So these are the things you play. And teachable moments happen all the time. You don't need any formal school for that. Like, you know, that this is the time frame where you're. So that happens. Then contextual teaching. So contextual teaching is like, as it says, it, it has, you know, it has a context. Suppose we took the kids to the zoo, you know, and then they got to see the animals. So it's both, you know, it's like uh, hands-on and uh, experience, you know, so they're experiencing the, the real stuff. And that is very important because uh, like Prague goes and does his grocery, and I set up, I saw this, you know, I read this article and all that. And then I set up a fake grocery store in my classroom for Parag with all that, you know, and doing it. It was so boring for me. You know, I'm like, what? You know, they, 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 and yeah. then and then I took like, you know, Prague and I went to do grocery. And there is a video of him doing grocery with me in, you know, in the book, like at the end of the book, uh, if you go to the YouTube channel. Anyhow, that became interesting. That was, he was, he was having fun. I was having fun. So these are the various methods when I, you know, that I have incorporated to teach him. But also there's another thing that I want to share is that, you know, what you said actually was that, you know, the world has become so, you know, computerized and we have all these uh, tablets around us, you know, those Mm -hmm. help these kids with drills and practice, but it human interaction cannot, cannot replace that, you know, because you, you cannot make them just, you know, if you are going to put them at the computer, it will help them with the drill and practice, but you know, how are they going to learn the facial expressions? How are they going, you know, the, the intonations, you know, so these we do and they're lacking Mm -hmm. in social skills. So they need people around them, you know, so. Mike, I had my mic muted. I'm sorry. Um, I've been saying for a long time now that one of the side effects to technology at the extreme degree is that people are becoming socially autistic because we're so captive to devices now. We walk around with handhelds. We sit at computers. We interact with machines. Entire generations, and I have so well said i'm very impressed (laughs) um but it's been a message you know and you just underscored that because we're dealing with children who natively do not have those skills you're doing the reverse of what most of the world is doing you are bringing a child out of a closeted state a state of closed offness and bringing him into interaction you know the eye contact the verbal contact the kinesthetic all of the different modalities all of the things that we're losing that are human to the technology if we're not careful about that. And, you know, in a lot of ways, I look at things, sometimes I reverse engineer them. I look at autistic kids and I go, I know there's something in there that wants to get out. Oh, yeah. so true. And 
there's a gift that wants to get out because I've seen it. I've seen it when I've interacted with autistic children. And um, it's a profound experience when you see the glimmer. And I, and I saw it a couple of times when I've interacted with autistic children. You would see that at some point something caught them just for a second. And you would see that little glimmer. And I imagine that as a teacher and as a parent, those were the moments for you that were probably like the gift, the breakthrough. Oh, yes. So, you know what, like, I, and it's something I have, I think about, like, you know, a lot of times uh, people talk about savant, you know, the kids, you know, they have savant skills and mm -hmm. be, um, what, you know, this is a little bit um, of a tricky topic when I'm going to talk. Oh, well, you're in the perfect place to go with <laughs> tricky topics. That's what we do. Here. <laughs> go for it. Okay. So, you know, um, Prague can play music by ear, you know? So, mm -hmm. yes. So, and I'll tell you what happened, how I found out was I took my older son to the, you know, because he wanted to play saxophone. So I went to buy a saxophone. Mm -hmm. And Prague started messing up on the side with, with all these guitar. And this, and I'm like, oh God, you know, he's going to break one. And then this uh, shopkeeper, he says, since when has he been playing? I'm like, really? <laughs> so it was not, <laughs> so it wasn't like, you know, it was always pleasant to the ears, like whatever he was doing, you know, that mm -hmm. I realized. So once he knew his alphabet, I had teachers coming, you know, who would teach him and then they will, uh, the school is upstairs. So they would come downstairs and say, Prad, play this for me. And then I'll go back and then he wouldn't play, you know? And then sometimes he would, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that Prague is able to now, he loves music. He has been now, Christmas time is, you know, almost here. So he has been singing Jingle Bell and, you know, and listening to Jingle Bell on the mm -hmm. iPad, you know. So, but he's able to, you know, uh, if we say Prague, you know, we have to go out, you know, can you put your music up? He is able to do that. Uh -huh. A lot of kids who... Uh, autistic kids, what happens to them is they, I've seen many of them love these computer games, you know, and they can play it for hours and hours. So, and when you try to take them away from those, you know, that game, mm -hmm. they're so amazing at it. So then there is a tantrum, there is a behavior problem. And that is what is a problem because they could be, what, what I'm trying to say is that every skill, every task that they learn should be for the, for their own benefit. They should be able to use it. You know, if it becomes a, a behavior problem or it uh, brings about a social um, phenomenon, you know, then it's not good. You know, so being a savant is a great thing. But if it comes into a day, you know, your day to day life you know, into your normal living, then it's not a good thing. So these kids who play this uh, video games, you know, they can actually, that skill can be used. You know, there are so many uh, companies where they try to, you know, uh, uh, to test their games. You know, they can be, these kids can be big help, you know, if they can harm them, I guess, you know, then just like Prague, what he does, he he's very good at sorting. We taught him that, you know, early on. Mm -hmm. Now he does my, you know, he takes out the things from my dishes and puts it everywhere very nicely. So a lot of skills can be used around the house, like daily living skill, life skills have to be taught early on because the more independent they are, the better it is for everybody and for them themselves, like, you know, they themselves need that. Mom, so we're almost out of time. We've got about a minute left. And okay. um, gosh, it went so fast. This was <laughs> such a cool conversation to have. Um, very different for what we do most of the time, but very uh, rewarding in terms of the topic itself and what you bring to the table. Are you currently working with any groups? Are you doing outreach in any way um, in terms of the book itself and, and uh, maybe groups locally or nationally speaking? Um, Actually, Randy, that's a great question because Jacksonville State University, it got a grant to start Center for Autism. 
uh, and we are going to, you know, we, we are blessed to help not just like so many kids will be able to do that. And um, I have always been involved, you know, with through my university to help these kids. And I'll, also I volunteer my time, you know, in school systems to help in general, special need kids and then kids with autism. But there's something before we uh, part, I want to say that all the parents, they need to know how to take respite because there is a big burnout rate, you know? So it, you know, and that it could be a small breaks, you know, but that is very important because this is a long journey and we need to be recharged, you know, to continue on this, you know, path of progress. I don't call it success, I call it progress. So. Yeah, that's a very important issue for anybody who's uh, uh, a caregiver in any capacity. And certainly in terms of this, it's a long journey. And it's your journey. And Mom, I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. I want to thank uh, Dr. Joseph Lumpkin, who is behind the publishing of this book, Fifth Estate Publishing. The book, as you can see on the screen, is uh, Autism, Our Journey in Finding Happiness, published by Fifth Estate Publishing. It's on Amazon. We will put links up to all of this You'll be able to look at the YouTube videos that we've been talking about and uh, get a taste for this. This is a resource for those of you out there in not just the autism uh, community, but anybody that's dealing with special needs situations. It's a resource that you should avail yourself to. We thank you so much for coming on tonight. We're going to close it out here. We'll be back again with another show next week. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet TV. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep searching for it. We'll be back very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs>